All right, hello students. Welcome to another video lecture for uh, ComSci 125 operating uh, systems. In this video, we're going to wrap uh, up the last chapter in the concurrency unit, and this chapter is all about event based concurrency. Now, before we proceed to this topic, Let's have a short uh, review of what we know so, so far about concurrency. So essentially what uh, we have learned is that if you are given a process, before the advent of the concurrency, normally a process which resides, which has its own address space, has a single uh, flow of execution and usually in C programs, this is in the main, this is the main uh, function. Later on, when, uh, so we assume that we have a single CPU. Let's denote the CPU as the triangle. And later on, with the introduction of concurrency, since developers realized or system designers realized that processes will usually have CPU burst and IO burst. So even though we are given a single processor represented by the triangle, we can actually have multiple flows of executions and these are called Threads. Now, with the advancement in hardware technology, it's now possible that we can have smaller cores. So you have quad core, and for a process, we can have. The box represents the process. If we have uh, four threads in a process, they can actually be uh, run in different cores or processors. So this is the advent of uh, the formal definition of parallelism. So we can we can refer to this as true concurrency. Well, this one is uh, simulated so this is now our uh, our main idea or the development of this uh, unit okay. so and the advantage of here uh, the advantage here is that of course, the processing can be speed uh, sped up because of uh, these cores here are actually different uh, hardware units. So there is really a true concurrency in this uh, in this approach. However, there are issues, especially uh, in the early part, uh, if we have if these threads try to access a shared resource so let's say the circle here is a shared resource so uh, we need to do some uh, to apply some techniques in order to prevent errors in the computation example would be the race condition right so we discuss different solutions for that so essentially that covers the this chapter the majority the main topics in this chapter so we talked about locks we talk about uh, condition variables. We also talk about semaphores. These are synchronization primitives. And then we also talk about some problems like the producer consumer problem and the dining philosophers problem. 
And we also talked about the readers, writers, problem, which is used in databases. So essentially, this, uh, these are the things that we've covered in this uh, unit. Okay. So uh, the last chapter in concurrency now for, uh, addresses the question that is it possible to have concurrency without using the thread abstraction like this one? Because uh, as we know, as we know now, there are uh, this approach presents several challenges, especially in terms of uh, sometimes in terms of performance because of the contention, especially if you have a shared resource. So let's speak to this. Okay, so let's talk about uh, event-based concurrency. So in addition to the thread, we have what we call event-based concurrency. What is this uh, event-based concurrency? So event-based concurrency is a different style of uh, concurrent programming. Okay. So again, uh, we try to, uh, the idea of concurrent programming is to have an illusion of multiple things happening at the same time, right? And uh, this is used, this event-based concurrency is actually used in uh, GUI-based applications and some types of internet servers. Now, in the case of GUI-based applications, probably you had experience using this in Java, right? So in Java, you have, let's say, you have a dialog box, and then you have a button here. When you click this button, the, uh, the, the program should do something. So you create, uh, let's say, an event handler or a key listener or unclick listener so that whenever a user clicks this button, the action defined in the, let's say, key listener will be executed. And for internet servers, this is actually used in uh, in GMX, and uh, probably you're using Node.js. So uh, this approach is basically uh, used in these types of systems. The problems that the event-based concurrency addresses uh, are, there are two, two main problems. The first one is uh, managing concurrency correctly as we've discussed in the previous chapters because we have problems like missing locks, uh, deadlock, uh, order violation, atomicity violation, and many others. So that's one. Another one is that the developer has little or no control over what is scheduled. So as I, I always repeat this, uh, this scenario, it is the scheduler that schedules the the thread. So at some point, we might the, ex, the expected execution order of execution may not be the one that is desired by the developer. So we have very uh, the developer has a very little control or no control at all in the scheduling of the threads, resulting to uh, to these problems, right? So, how does this uh, event-based concurrency work? So, the basic idea is to have an event loop, as shown in this uh, code fragment here. So, this is called the uh, event loop. Well, what happens here is it loops uh, forever while one, and there is a line here that tries to get the events and if there are any events and then the events are returned to, to these variable events. If there are many events, then you can have a loop that uh, processes all the returned events and then that event is uh, processed. So if you will recall, this is similar to the event handler, uh, this one, this line of code here uh, that you created in your Compsize 22 class. 
right? So the approach is to wait for something and then for, for an event to happen, check the type of event and then uh, do the work process the event. Now, the question is how exactly does an event-based server determine which events are taking place, right? So you have to say, uh, let's let's just have let's just consider writing an, an a server a network service a TCP server. We'll discuss more of this TCP thing in Comsai 137. But uh, let's take a look at that example. Right? How does the server, let's say a TCP server, uh, determine which events are taking place? So. The answer to that is the use of uh, APIs. In this case, uh, we have both select and all API. The select API or the select function check, uh, whether, checks whether there is any incoming IO that should be attended to. This is the uh, function prototype for the select. You will notice that you have how many parameters here. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, five parameters. You might as well take a look at the uh, man page of this uh, function. So here is the man page for uh, select. So this is the function. Uh, Prototype, so an FDS, FD, uh, uh, FDs usually represent means file descriptors, right? So set of file descriptors, FD set, read FDS, write FDS, exception, except FDS, and then time. And you have uh, these additional functions, right? So let's look at the description. Uh, select and pselect allows a program to monitor multiple uh, file descriptors. It's an interesting uh, thing. And uh, waiting until one or more of the file descriptors become ready for some class of IO operation. A file descriptor is considered ready if it is possible to perform corresponding operations like reading or uh, writing without blocking. So this is an important uh, requirement. Uh, should be able to read and write without uh, blocking. And this select function uh, does that. Okay, so uh, read uh, FDS parameter lets the server determine that a new, let's say for example, since we are talking about a network server, TCP server, uh, it can tell us, uh, it can tell the caller or the server that a new packet has arrived or a connection has been established. Uh, and then the right FDS, right file descriptors uh, represent uh, the which uh, file descriptor to write to. Right? So let's say it's okay to reply. And you also have a timeout uh, parameter, which when set to null, uh, this will uh, make the select call a block indefinitely until uh, a descriptor is ready. Or if it is set to zero, uh, the select call will uh, return immediately. When you say block, it uh, it waits. Right? When you say uh, the function blocks, it, it waits. Right? It, uh, the next instruction will not be executed. So here's an example of how to use the select APR, the select uh, function. So let, this is a common pattern when writing uh, event-based uh, concurrency. Okay? So here is how here is how the structure of the code uh, looks like. So you have the main function, and then this is the main event loop while one, and then you specify the file descriptors to to read. 
So you define that as FD set, and then you uh, set the values of these file descriptors to zero. So let's uh, take a look at the one page to better understand this code. So FD set is a set of file descriptors. There's no description here. So there's no description for the FD set, but it's a basically a file descriptors, a set of file descriptors, and then okay. So FD zero will Okay, so FD0 will uh, clear the set, okay? and then FD set will uh, add or remove a given uh, file descriptor on the set. So it basically initializes the uh, read the file descriptors. Okay, so. So once this set is uh, empty, now empty because of this FD0, right? Uh, we can now uh, set the file descriptors, right? Okay, so as you can see, you can add now the file descriptors that we would like to use uh, for the select call. So let's say uh, we, we have a local variable here, FD. And then say a minimum uh, file descriptor, and then up to the maximum file descriptor. So we add uh, these file descriptors to the set using this FD set call. And then we do the select. Uh, we call the select. So select, uh, we have a max FD plus one. Always do that. And then the address of the file descriptor set. And that's it. Okay. And then after this call, okay, we can check which uh, actually have data uh, in them in the file descriptor by using the function fd underscore is set. For example, again, we have the variable fd, then we iterate to the file, uh, to the list of file descriptors that we would like to monitor. And probably a socket, uh, 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 the file descriptor returned by a socket. And then you check if there is uh, data in that particular file descriptor. And then we process the file descriptor. So this is fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, main, uh, mainly three steps creating the file descriptor set and set, setting it initially empty. And then adding the the file descriptors to the set. Then next is calling the select function, and then next one is checking whether any of the file descriptors can be written, can be read from or uh, written to. So the question is, uh, why uh, is this simpler, right? Uh, the problem that uh, we are trying to address uh, in this uh, example is, let's say, let's take a look at, let's say, a server. Let's, let's call this the echo server. In the echo server, you have a process here. It's called the server process. So if we have clients here, this client will try to connect to this one, right? Now, what we want actually is, if this is the server, we would like to support multiple clients, right? We would like to support multiple clients. Now, if we don't have some form of concurrency in our server, Let's say we have several clients here. 
before, if you don't have some form of concurrency, before B can, a can be able to access the server, it has, ser the server has to uh, serve A first and then uh, next B first. So one step at a time in sequence, depending on the order. Okay, so that's the problem that we are trying to solve. Now, if we have some form of concurrency, what actually happens is uh, this one, uh, the main server will be, uh, will just be the main entrance, right? So what will happen is if we have some form of uh, concurrency, let's erase this, okay. So if we have some form of concurrency, the server will act as an end, just an, uh, a domain, the front door, front gate. And then when the client connects here, a new, uh, a new uh, mini, mini server, or actually a friend, okay, will be created so that uh, A will now communicate to this, okay? And let's say B also connected. So if B connected, okay, once the server receives that, it will spawn a, a mini server or a thread basically. And then communication will now happen on this particular thread. So you get the idea. So that is the, this is, this is how most how servers actually work, right? The Apache, uh, the web servers or the servers that you use in uh, the internet. So going back, uh, so why are, why is event-based concurrency simpler? The first, of course, uh, the most obvious one is we don't need locks to be able to service all the uh, the clients as shown earlier. So the event-based server cannot be interrupted by another thread because you only have the main function, which is the main thread. And uh, so you have a single CPU and uh, uh, you just have a single event-based application, for example. And uh, Basically, it's a single threaded and the concurrency bugs common in threaded programs do not manifest. So there's no need to, there's no need for doing some uh, lockings and implementing condition variables, etc. So those are the main advantage of this event-based approach. Now, what can be some issues that might be encountered with event-based concurrency? So one is uh, blocking system calls, okay? Uh, some system calls will uh, block, meaning we'll have to wait. Let's say, for example, if you have a read call and the the file descriptor associate, uh, the, the file descriptor is associated to a file in the file system on the disk, then uh, the read will block. It will not return immediately because uh, perhaps the file is very large, so it will uh, or it will wait, right? So uh, there are no other threads to run, so just the main event loop. So essentially, uh, let's take what is called. Let's say this one here. If FD is a read, is a read call. It is a read call and it blocks, then the execution of the entire loop will not proceed because uh, the read is uh, blocking, right? So that is a potential uh, waste of resources. So as much as possible, whenever you process 
threads, uh, whenever you process events, you don't use calls that uh, block to process these events. You need to do some uh, to do some additional uh, techniques or use employ additional or employ a different technique in order to process the event. Okay. So uh, a solution uh, in most operating system is the introduction of asynchronous IOs because by default uh, the IO model is uh, synchronous. Okay. So this asynchronous I.O. enables an application to issue an I.O. request and then uh, return control immediately. Right? So for example, as I mentioned here, if this read call uh, is trying to read a file, a large file, load a large file, it will not wait for the entire large file to be uh, to be to be loaded to memory before the next instruction can can execute. So that is the idea of uh, asynchronous I/O. So here, even though if the the file is not yet fully loaded in the main memory, the read call will return immediately. So here's an example, and of course it will require additional state or additional information in order to accomplish this uh, ability to return control immediately. For example, we have here the, I think this is in the, in the, in the map. So you have uh, uh, a asynchronous IO control block or something, and uh, it has uh, these fields, file descriptors, offset, uh, buffer, and uh, uh, length of transfer. So basically, just to be able to keep track of the state, okay, of let's say of the I/O operation. Okay. So this is an interface provided uh, on Mac OS X. Uh, the API is revolved around a basic structure called the uh, struct AIO AIOCB, okay, a control block. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, how is that. And uh, given this structure, there is there's a set of functions or API that can be used to perform asynchronous I/O. For example, uh, you have the read here, so you simply add AIO. This means it will perform uh, asynchronous read. Traditionally, the uh, the or by default, the parameter of read is a file descriptor, right? Now this time, uh, the the parameter now is a control block, AIO control block pointer here. So if successful, it returns right away, and the application can continue with its work. Right? So if you're transferring a large file, the information about the status of the transfer is actually stored in this uh, uh, structure. Now, it checks whether the request referred to by uh, IO uh, CBP has completed. So this one is uh, the one that checks. So you can actually try to check whether the the IO has completed. Right. So you have AIO error function. Again, you have the you have to pass a pointer to the AIO CB uh, uh, structure, and you do this periodically. Right. So it should, actually, it should be poll, period, periodically poll the system via uh, AIO error. If it is completed, it will return success. Otherwise, uh, it will return an e in progress uh, error. So the idea here is the read, the read call will not wait for a long time. Right? After calling it, it will return immediately and proceed to get the next event in the event loop. And how do we uh, how do we determine whether the let's say the I/O has completed already? So you can usually do that using uh, interrupts, or in Linux or in Unix we have signals. Right? So uh, this one actually is uh, uh, this approach here of polling the 
the status of uh, the asynchronous I.O. is quite expensive. Right? So to eliminate this uh, check, okay, uh, the, the system or the server can use signals to inform applications when an uh, asynchronous I.O. completes. Right? So this uh, eliminates the task of repeatedly asking the system. Now, so that solves the problem of uh, blocking system calls. So the next one is uh, state management, right? So state management would uh, require servers, for example, to uh, pass information right, after processing events, maintain uh, some, let's say, the status of the server, right, the status of the connection, uh, when processing uh, several events, so how does this state? How are these state managed by the by uh, by, the, by an event-based server? Okay. So it says it is more complicated. Right. So the idea is that the server must package uh, some program state uh, for the next event handler to use when the I/O completes. So let's say if you have uh, this is something to do with. Uh, similar to thread communication, right? Uh, in threads, uh, recall that in threads, when we talk about threads, uh, all threads reside in the same uh, address space. So the state in a thread is usually stored in the stack. Okay. So in threads, there's no problem with the state management because uh, everything is stored uh, on the stack in relation to the thread, right? which is unique to the thread. So uh, that's uh, one thing. But in an event-based server, uh, additional information should be uh, should be maintained by the server itself, independent of, of the threads, uh, unlike in the threads. Okay, so, a solution is, uh, let's, say, let's have this example, an event-based system. So here we have, uh, this is the read uh, call, and uh, this is the return code, and then we have a write call, and this is the return code. So first issue uh, the read uh, asynchronously, then the, the way to do this is to check for complete uh, for the completion of the read sync, and then uh, the call informs us that the read is complete. Right now, how does the event server uh, know what to do next? So that's basically the uh, idea of uh, uh, event management. So after informing the how, after informing the server, okay, the read is complete. What do you do now? Right. So that's uh, uh, state management problem. So a solution uh, is what they call continuation, wherein uh, uh, the needed information is recorded okay, in some data structure. So you need to define some uh, global data structure to uh, store this state. And when an event happens, I right, say uh, a signal is received when an I/O uh, is completed. Right, that the 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 information is looked up in this uh, data structure to be able to uh, continue to proceed with the task that the server has to do. So that's state uh, management. So. What is still difficult with uh, later on? I will I show an example. Uh, what is still difficult with events? So there are other issues associated with events, but nowadays, uh, actually, uh, event-based servers are popular. An example of that will be Node.js. Right? So uh, a lot of people will uh, use Node.js for writing web applications. So that because Node.js uh, supports uh, JavaScript on the server side, and the, the developer just needs to learn 
one language JavaScript or TypeScript to be able to write web applications. No need for a different language for the client and no need for the uh, for the front end or a different language for the back end. So you can just use uh, JavaScript. So makes the life of the developer easier. And also in terms of performance, since Node.js is uh, uh, event-based, then uh, it eliminates the troubles with uh, locks, uh, condition variables, and other synchronization issues. But uh, event-based approaches is not perfect. Okay, so what are some of the issues uh, that might that needs to be addressed. The first one is uh, system move from a single CPU to multiple CPU. So let's say we have, uh, it's good if we have an event-based uh, concurrency, if we have only a single core. Like what, what if we have multiple cores? So the simplicity, the simplicity will actually be gone because the synchronization problems will surface eventually, right? Because you need to, uh, have multiple uh, multiple event handlers running on different cores or on different uh, processors. The next one is it does not integrate well uh, with the certain kinds of systems activity. So for the developer, uh, it's easy, but for the develop uh, the system operating system designer, okay, uh, or the developer of the server itself. Uh, there might be issues. For example, uh, in the case of paging, a server will not make progress until uh, the page for complete. So uh, you cannot uh, just ignore this fact in an operating system, right? So we, uh, the, this conflicts, the event-based concurrency conflicts with this paging because with paging, the transfer of the page from the disk to, to the main memory should be uh, complete. I should not be uh, partial, right? So that, uh, that's one conflict. The next one is uh, it's hard to manage uh, over time, right? So the exact semantics of various routines changes. So as the code base grows, several changes might happen. And since uh, there's too much dependency, for example, in the case of state management, Whenever, let's say, a routine, a non-blocking routine changes to blocking because of some uh, requirements, then there is a need to change the event handler also. So it will require additional work. And then lastly, asynchronous uh, disk I.O. never quite integrates with uh, asynchronous uh, network. So, uh, I.O., we'll discuss this in the succeeding chapter, okay? uh, I.O. would require, can have disk, okay, input output or over the network. So there is a uh, conflict in terms of, uh, not just conflict, the integration is difficult for uh, disk I.O. and uh, network I.O. Okay? So it's not that easy to integrate this uh, to so, yeah, because of course we need, there is a need to uh, say, uh, to, put, to merge, select, and uh, asynchronous. So uh, there you get the you have the additional uh, difficulties when it comes to uh, using event uh, based and colors. So as an aside, uh, I think I've mentioned this already uh, about processes when we discussed about processes, so about signals. So usually a uh, process can send a, uh, a signal to uh, other processes. Okay? So here's an example uh, code. Okay? So here uh, you have the main function and uh, you call the sec uh, you call the signal function. You specify the signal that will be received and the handler. That means when uh, a process receives the uh, signal hang up, okay. When a signal hang up hang up is sent to this process, it will execute this uh, code. Stop uh, waking me up. 
Okay? And the main function just simply uh, does nothing. Okay? So it, here is a sample output. Okay? So uh, we run the main program in the background and then we send, uh, and it's the process ID of this main program. We send a hang up signal to this process and then the signal handler actually uh, is executed. Okay? So this is, uh, this mechanism is uh, uh, related to this part. Okay, so that's it. Now let's take a look at some code. And it's all L. Okay. So I have here some codes about server. So let's uh, start with uh, echo server p thread. Okay. So I just got this from uh, the web. Okay. But well, basically a simple uh, example. So uh, this is. Uh, So this is the figure that will refer to that. So when a client connects to the server, it will spawn a thread. This will be the thread, the P thread, and then that will be used to communicate between the client and the server. So let's see how, how this code is implemented. So this is the connection handler, which is basically the the thread function the name. Uh, you don't need to understand everything here. Uh, this is for ComSci 137 networking. But uh, just to give you a few examples, so you have the socket uh, call here, system call, which create a socket. And uh, this one here, uh, so notice that we have a server uh, socket here. And then we set the, sock, the server socket to in, an internet socket. Uh, the source address can be any address. Can, any IP address can connect to the server. And this is the port number 8888. And then this one will bind the socket. Okay. And then this one uh, is the part where the server socket will listen, the server will listen for connections and then uh, this is the part this one this is the code except that uh, whenever a client connects it will uh, uh, accept that okay, and it will return a client socket so what happens is that client socket is passed to the as you can see here it is passed to the uh, as an argument to the p thread okay so that's why uh, in this uh, code here right, uh, in this illustration here so this uh, thread here uh, will have access to the client socket which has the descriptor so that the client can uh, the, this thread can uh, read write by right, communicate with the client so this is essentially what it does, and let's try this. So the connection handler uh, basically, okay, uh, this is the thread function, the P thread. So you have the this is where the uh, socket, the client socket uh, is uh, passed. So you can see here that it is uh, type casted here, and then it becomes the socket descriptor, and it is used to. Uh, for the right and uh, for the right system call, for the right call here, sending a message to the client is the part that sent. So at this point, it is the thread that is now communicating with the uh, with the uh, uh, with uh, the client, okay? the child thread. Okay, so let's try this code if it works. So, 
Okay, so it records from P thread. Okay. Great, so we run it. Uh, it's now waiting for connections. So uh, let's connect uh, a good command uh, in Linux to connect to internet sockets is the NC command, so NC local host, and the port number is 888. And so you see that the server now uh, has something. So hello, and then uh, this one here. Uh, and let's also connect. So we have another uh, client, server client. So this is how the traditional way of concurrency, implementing concurrency for uh, an echo server, right? So you use P threads to handle the connection to read and write. Right? So event-based concurrency uses uh, the select uh, select call. So let's take a look at select plane. So what it does is it's a TCP server. Uh, it got it from CMU, example code. Uh, error is the main, uh, main function. Okay parent file descriptor, child file descriptor, port number, uh, by access of the client's address. So can ignore this, we're interested in the pattern of using select. So first it needs some argument, port number, okay. And this one creates the server socket, similar to the one mentioned earlier. And then, set the options for the socket, initialize the internet address, and again, this is an internet uh, socket, okay? and then uh, the server will accept any, uh, uh, will accept from any IP address, and then the port number uh, is uh, passed here, and then the usual bind, and then this one this is the one that listens, so it accepts five uh, clients. And then, so this is the, the main loop, the wild one in the event-based uh, example uh, in, in the slides. Okay, so this is well not done. So we zero out the read file descriptor. Uh, we add the uh, parent file descriptor to the read FS, so parent FD is the socket ID, and then we have the zero is the file descriptor for STD, standard input, so we add that to the uh, read file descriptor also, and then we perform the uh, select call here. So after that, we need to check now the uh, file descriptors. So if, uh, if the user entered the command, so this is the part here. So take note that this is the zero is uh, is the is the file descriptor for STD, and so the user accepted some input. Okay, or has entered some command. So read that and then uh, put that in the buffer, and then uh, compare that. Okay, compare the input. If it is C, uh, you print the connection found. Okay. Uh, otherwise, quit. Okay. And then, okay, so if a connection uh, request has arrived, okay, we, add, we added only the parent uh, file descriptor. So we accept, uh, we accept that. Okay. We accept this uh, socket connection okay, because a connection was requested. And then we increment the connect count. And then uh, what we do is to read from the input and then write back to the child uh, file descriptor. And uh, everything ends. So let's try this. So 
select plane that C, then it's scroll. Level uh, L. Then I run this. I will need to specify a four port, so let's use the same port that we used earlier, port number. Okay, so the server is now uh, accepting commands, so let's type C. So no connection so far. So let's uh, connect, try to connect. Okay. And then let's type C. Uh, no input, so let's type hello. Okay, so you have, uh, uh, we received one connection so far. Hello, so this is an echo server. So uh, we, uh, we have one connection so far, this one. Now let's try to connect using another uh, console for it. So, and let's see if the number of connections has increased. So we now have uh, two connections, uh, five. So it's uh, gone now. So let's see how many connections we have. Still two connections, but... Uh, okay, so it stopped also. Yeah, still, there are still bugs in this code, but uh, it shows us how uh how the select call can be used to support concurrency meaning uh we are able to uh connect two clients two clients to the server without uh using uh trends Okay, so that will be the end for this lecture. See you on the next uh, lecture.